In this video, we cover a few highlights from Chapter 1 of The Logic Course Adventure. First, logic and form. Our focus is on the form or structure of our reasoning. Consider forms in our daily lives, such as skeletons, blueprints, or cake molds. Forms take various content. So, for example, we know that uh, on top of skeletons or sort of filling out the skeleton, you have blood and guts and organs and things like that, and on top of that, skin, right? Um, blueprints are uh, enacted by way of uh, constructing, let's say, uh, a home where you have uh, a, a structure, a frame, and then uh, you build onto that, around it, and in it if you will. Similarly, we can think about sentences as having form, uh, but sentences that have the same form having, let's say, different content. For example, if you breathe, then you are alive. If you are in class, you are in a learning environment. If you see a pit bull, you see an adorable dog. If you are 18 or younger, your birth year is after 2000 before Common Era. The following are examples of a single reasoning form whose sentences have different content. If you breathe, then you are alive. You breathe, so you're alive. If you are in class, you are in a learning environment. You are in class, so you are in a learning environment. As you can see, the sentences are all of the same form. They're hypothetical claims, conditional claims that have an if-then structure. And then the two examples that I offered are examples of the same reasoning form, also with different content. Notice that the two examples of one form of reasoning involve a specific relationship between the reasons and the claim, namely certainty. Let's try to think about it this way. When the form of our reasoning is correct, the, reasoning guaran the reasons guarantee the outcome. In other words, the structure of the reasons, not the content, entail the outcome. If you breathe, then you are alive. You breathe, so you're alive. If you are in class, you are in a learning environment. You are in class, so you are in a learning environment. The same argument or reasoning form is what uh, entails, or involves, sorry, uh, the entailment of the conclusion from the evidence given or the reasons provided. So the first two sentences in each of these reasoning examples guarantee the third sentence. The content, breathing, living, being in class, being in a learning environment, the content is irrelevant to the fact that the form of the reasoning is what generates entailment. Another way to think of this is in terms of the, the, the term validity. Uh, a piece of reasoning is valid when it's impossible to deny or reject the conclusion if the premises, that is the evidence, the reasons given, are true. And that if is a big if. The, the, the very meaning of a premise is that which is accepted as true, that which we use as a starting point to proceed in the reasoning. Let's look at another example. Joe Biden, or Barack Obama, is the 44th President of the United States. Joe Biden is the 46th U.S. President. He's not the 44th, so Barack Obama is the 44th. And again, same form as the argument we just looked at, the same uh, form as the piece of reasoning we just looked at, but the content is different. The moon is made of blue or green cheese. The moon is not made of blue cheese, so the moon is made of green cheese. Right. Notice that in the last two cases, we've got the same form, but the content of each is different. It's the form, however, 
that generates entailment. It's the form of the reasoning that forces us to accept the inference, Barack Obama is president or the moon is made of green cheese, in each piece of reasoning. And assuming that the first two sentences are true, the third is entailed or the third must be true. Now, what we've just seen is a set of examples that uh, are classified as deductive reasoning. Now, the examples that we've uh, just looked at uh, are instances of reasoning that's classified as deductive. Now, we'll see as we go forward that we can evaluate any argument we want in terms of entailment or validity. And it may be the case that some logicians will say that we've evaluated uh, a non-deductive argument according to a deductive assessment concept, namely entailment or validity. Um, but that wouldn't stop us from doing it, right? But, the, but what typically distinguishes uh, an argument is not uh, the way that we assess it, right, as, as uh, valid or invalid, but instead uh, the, the typical way that we classify a, a piece of reasoning is whether or not it proceeds experientially or not. And that's what the, the inductive-deductive distinction is. So let, let's consider the following reasoning. At least one dog is a puppy. At least one puppy is a pit bull. So, at least one dog is a pit bull. Now you're thinking, oh yeah, all those sentences are true. Uh, the conclusion must be true because the, all the sentences are true. But remember from our prior example about the, the moon being made of green cheese, right? Um, the, it's not the sentences being actually true or false that uh, uh, generate entailment or that generate a valid piece of reasoning. Instead, it's the structure of the argument, right? So we'd say, huh, okay, this puppy argument, uh, while it is it is the case that the sentences are true, uh, does not, uh, uh, is not valid, right? It is an invalid argument. Or we'd say that the premises or the evidence, the reasons given in the first two sentences uh, do not entail the third, right? Um, but we might say that as, as far as experience goes, right, this argument is pretty powerful, right? So, you know, if we, if we evaluate the reasoning according to entailment, the, the reasoning fails. But if we evaluate the reasoning according to what experience teaches us, we'd say, oh, it's pretty strong reasoning. That said, as I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, typically, logicians will distinguish an argument not based on its uh, evaluation concept, that is, whether it's valid or invalid, or in the case, or, or strong or weak, but instead uh, will classify an argument according to whether or not it, it fits a, 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 an experiential pattern of reasoning or a, a common uh, deductive form. So this argument that you're looking at, this piece of reasoning, is typically uh, um, referred to as a categorical syllogism, and a categorical syllogism is uh, classified as a deductive uh, uh, way to reason. So we would say that this is uh, an example of deductive logic. It just happens to be the case that the logic uh, is not so hot. In other words, the inference fails. How do we? How can we demonstrate that this inference fails? Well, let's go ahead and uh, think about uh, generating a, a counterexample, right? So this comment that I have here sort of summarizes uh, what I've just said about the fact that the reasoning uh, is does not uh, is not logically correct. In other words, the first two sentences do not guarantee the third is true. Okay. That said, we'd, we can also say that we're pretty confident uh, that the thir third sentence is true by experience. In other words, uh, experience teaches us that the first two sentences make very likely uh, the third. So here's our counter example, which shows how it is that, the, that this argument about the puppy is logically uh, flawed. 
right? So the form is the same, but we're putting different content in. So at least one apple is a fruit. At least one fruit is an orange. So at least one apple is an orange. True uh, first two uh, sentences, that is first uh, true premises, false conclusion. So whenever you can falsify the inference, you know that the reasoning is invalid. Or another way to put it is that uh, the uh, argument's premises fail to entail the conclusion. Okay, so to sum up uh, some of the ideas that uh, we were talking about in the previous slide, we can say the following. When we reason from experience, as in the case of the dog reasoning, we reason inductively. When we reason independently of experience, we reason deductively. So uh, think about the, the, uh, the following. If I switch on a, uh, or I, I turn the switch on a lamp and nothing happens, the light doesn't go on, um, I draw an inference. I might say, huh, oh, uh, the bulb must have burned out. And I say must have, but what I'm really saying is I'm quite confident that the reason, the explanation for the, for the light not turning on is that the bulb burned out, right? And maybe more evidence uh, would, would make my, my uh, conclusion even, even more plausible. So for example, if let's say other lights on the same switch turn on, um, but, the, but the one in question doesn't, right? That gives me more reason to believe that I'm correct, that the, that the bulb has burned out, right? Uh, but if, on the other hand, uh, I want to uh, reason independently of experience, now I'm looking at the, the structure of the argument. Um, I'm also going to, I'll, I'll, I'll probably uh, look at uh, the meanings of terms. So, you know, for example, if I say A, is larger than B, B is larger than C, I draw the inference A is larger than C because I understand what larger than the relational uh, predicate means. So an, easy, an even easier way to think about the difference between deductive and inductive uh, reasoning is in terms of validity or entailment, which is what, we were, what I was initially talking about, right? I, if I can evaluate an argument um, I can evaluate a piece of reasoning in terms of whether or not it satisfies the, the uh, requirement of validity or entailment, right? Then I, I know that I've got a deductive argument. Of course, as I said before, you know, lots of invalid arguments um, are, are also um, deductive because they share, sorry, rephrase, because they have a form that is very similar to a valid argument. So take a look at these two examples and you'll understand why we classify uh, certain arguments even though they may be invalid. Uh, let me be more specific. Certain types uh, um, or patterns of arguments or forms of argument as deductive even though they may be invalid. And that's because they look very similar to those forms that are valid, right? So valid argument. If I am a Pierce student, then I am in the United States. I am a Pierce student, so I am in the United States, right? Uh, if I am uh, a, a, an LA Pierce student, then I am in the US. I am in the US, so I am an LA Pierce student, right? In this case, in the second case, uh, the affirmation of the consequent, as it's known, does not entail the antecedent. In other words, uh, I'm not guaranteed by being in the United States that I am therefore a Los Angeles peer student. On the other hand, uh, when I affirm the antecedent, when I am an LA Pierce student, then I affirm, I must affirm I am in the United States. Finally, um, let's uh, return to uh, the, the focus of the course, which is 
uh, systems of deductive logic. So, you know, it's good for us to clarify what we're studying by look, making a comparison to, in this case, inductive reasoning, right? So, so what we're focusing on when we study systems of deductive logic is we look at uh, the, the uh, systematically, methodologically, not only the ways in which uh, sentences entail uh, another sentence or other sentences, but we also uh, look at the logical structure of those sentences themselves because they, they play a role in entailment, right? Um, and we also, uh, as, as we're studying this idea of entailment, um, we're also going to learn um, techniques uh, for uh, proving that entailment. When we broaden our study of logic to include uh, inductive reasoning, uh, thing you know, reasoning, for example, that's involved, uh, or sorry, the sort of reasoning uh, that um, uh, is involved in analogical or or scientific um, uh, arguments. Uh, then what we're focusing on is probabilistic reasoning. So we can certainly reason uh, uh, to a conclusion that is not certain, um, and we do that best when we have when we follow um, specific procedures uh, for uh, reasoning by way of experience. Right. So you know, think about how. Uh, careful scientific experimentation is in order to draw um, good experiential conclusions, right? That's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about trying to, one of the ways that we talk when we're trying to talk about um, uh, what it means to reason well experientially. So, if my car doesn't start, you know, so here's something that's not scientific, it's just sort of ordinary experience, but it gives you a, a way of thinking about what, what we've just said. You know, so if my car doesn't start and it's a, it's a standard gas guzzler, right? Um, I conclude uh, that my battery is dead because that's much more plausible, right? Than concluding that grem gremlins ate my engine. And this is partly, by the way, you know, what's at issue when we uh, talk about people who draw um, peculiar <laughs> inferences uh, and, and make wild claims about states of affairs that we call, you know, conspiracy theorizing. It's just not plausible given what experience teaches us. All right. So chapter one, important concepts, the highlight concepts uh, uh, are as follows. We focus in our study on the form of our reasoning, the form of our sentences, and uh, we focus on how sentences entail or not uh, another sentence or a chain of sentences.